get some footage of this. Oh, yeah. Can so we put this on the vlog? Can we? Yeah, if you want some like that. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Here you go. Oh, oh my god. That is, you can see Teddy Bear in that kind of. Hey, you. Sharing? You sharing? <laughs> Sharing's caring. Oh my god, how adorable is that? I think that's the word. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Be gentle, they're really gentle. Oh, yeah, pausing massive. Oh, you're giving me a lick. That's why I was licking you now. We think he's oh, going to be massive. Hello. This is going to be a massive thing. You enjoyed seeing those little snippets of our adventures down in Kent at the Wire Woods Centre. We were really, really spoiled because my friend Mark, who manages the site, took us round. Hold on, we're going in a minute. Took us round on a behind the scenes guided tour of the place. Absolutely fascinating. Now, we went there for our own pleasure, but we actually went there to get some ideas, do a bit of problem solving for projects and ideas that hopefully, hold on, let this helicopter go over and I'll tell you more. That was noisy. So we went there to Wildwoods really to get ideas, look at problem solving of ideas we're formulating because the two businesses, the two education and conservation businesses which are Icarus Falconry and Raptor Exotics have been affected by the covid pandemic just like many many kinds of businesses we've had no help whatsoever really from anywhere only our great customers really hold on so we're looking to next year we're looking at how we can make changes what we can do differently what we can do better and what we can offer as a completely different aspect of our conservation ethos and our education so keep watching this space we're going to keep thinking we're going to keep looking we're going to keep working out problems and costs and hopefully next year we'll have some things in place hopefully as part of the Holden Beer Estate that might just change how we do things and I wouldn't say improve because we think we do things really well but give us a wider spectrum of how we reach people in the message of conservation now one thing that was interesting about Wild was wasn't the animals that I knew wait a minute wasn't the animals that I knew would fascinate me. Of course, everyone knows I'm passionate about adders and red squirrels, pine martins. How can you not be thrilled to see those things in huge naturalistic enclosures? Um, 
big animals like wolves and elk, wow, but they don't do it for me, big animals really. But I did have a bit of a tear-jerking moment when I got to meet two 15-month-old bear cubs. I hope you enjoyed seeing them, but what you see cannot portray what I felt seeing them up close. And that's what we do. This is great. Getting the message out there via vlogs and videos is great. But you've got to come and see us and be part of this or go out in the wide world, the natural world, and see it, make it tangible for yourself. That's what we do. But for now, it's pouring of rain. The only guy on flying today is Wurzel. He's getting really anxious to get out because he wants his lunch. So we're going to brave the elements. We're going to go and fly Wurzel. Come along with us. See if you can cope with this awful, still, but rainy weather. Come and see. Just arrived at the Fulcrum Centre. Look at the weather. It's been pouring now solid for two days, absolutely rank. Um, it's Saturday, it poured around all day yesterday. That's when I do my usual deep clean and double check everything's good in the Averys. I did do it yesterday, but I'll do it today. Maybe it'll stop raining, no such luck whatsoever. So we're gonna do it now. Um, it's actually, we've had such a dry summer, it's actually caused a bit of flooding. The rivers are topping out, the fields have been hard, so the water's ran off. Uh, there's floods in some of the fields, the roads are absolutely treacherous. I've just driven up the M1 motorway and there's ambulances and police cars and scene investigation all blue lighted, whizzing past, so not a lot of good news going up there. Um, have a look at these photos, I'm going to sort of put them on the screen and talk over them maybe. Uh, that I was sent today. Now, I've already said earlier in the vlog that the big animals, they're not really my thing. I love fish, I love reptiles, I love invertebrates. They're the things that really get me really interested. So it's not good when my wife gets a phone call from a friend this morning. And these are company in photos to say, what do we do and what kind of snake is this? Now it's a huge female grass snake, really important in its ecosystem. And it's got its head stuck in a Coke can. Could have been a small mammal, could have been a lizard, could have been a frog, could have been all kinds of things, could have been a bird. I posted recently, or actually commented on someone's Facebook post recently, that it's, it's a paradox. All I do is spend my life trying to enthuse people to go outside into the countryside, enjoy nature, learn about nature, get out there, take your kids out there. And I posted the paradox is, if an area gets overrun with us people, it usually actually is detrimental to the wild and wildlife, plant life, animal life there. It actually impacts on them. This was taken at a local country park. So somewhere that's encouraging people to use the countryside, be immersed in the countryside. People can turn up, they can turn up with food and picnics. And you know what, they've drank all their drinks, they've eaten all their food. And all of a sudden, the weight of the empty cartons is too much to carry. And they've tossed it in the side there. And the snake, a really important snake, that snake's a big adult female that's well into breeding age. And it's gonna die. Now, it isn't going to die because luckily we gave them some advice. We actually said, if you can't carry this out, bag it up, bring it up here and we'll sort it out and take it back. But they've managed to cut the can open gently. The snake hasn't got any damage around its neck. Um, brave people. They didn't even know what snake it was. They were quite scared. And as it was hissing when it was cross, they didn't quite believe us it was non-venomous. But of course, it's just a lovely grass snake. And they've released that snake. So the good news is there's good people out there. The bad news is, while we encourage people into the countryside, we encourage all the idiots and lazy 
beep beep people. So it's a real paradox. I want you guys to take your kids into the countryside. I want you to marvel at the beauty of nature and the reptiles and other and the small things. The small things for kids are so important. Let them see the ladybirds and the ants and things like that. Let them discover and get that spark. But you've got to really look after the place that you're visiting. So that was a, a sad start to my morning with a happy ending, but made me really cross. Have a look at that wildlife pond we put in this summer up at the Falkland Centre. It's already naturalised. Now it was filled up out the hose pipe. It was topped up once in the drought. But look at this. It's pretty much up to the top again due to the recent rain. It shows how much rain we've actually had. You can see it naturalised here. We've got some stinging nettles going on here. This area here. No fishing, of course. This area here. We've got foxgloves, we've got hellebores, we've got a silver birch tree in the top there. More nettles, forget-me-nots. Various wildflowers, various weeds, you want to call them that, but here they're going to be filtered out and managed. Just like most things in the countryside nowadays, it does need managing if you want diversity, and that's the key. So. For instance, the tortoises are going to get a lot of those stinging nettles. They love stinging nettles, strangely enough. So they'll be pulled out. Some of the plantains here, some of these linear leaf plantains, they'll be left, so they'll be taken out. But look at the pond. It's really matured now. We've got a lot of duckweed float on the surface that we pull out quite regularly because we don't want it completely shaded out. Again, managing that environment for the benefit of a, a wider variety of hopefully natural life in there. Lots of invertebrate life and I'm 99.9% .9 sure next spring we're going to see great crested newts in here, we're going to see smooth newts in here and we're going to see common frogs and toads in here. So remember that, come the spring and we'll see what is breeding in here but without any shadow of a date there's going to be amphibians that have arrived naturally breeding in this pond and I know that because I found all of those species in the general locality but again as we've always mentioned wildlife pond it's all about make it look natural and you can't do that if any of the pond edge is showing whether you're using a preformed pond or a liner you've got to get rid of that edge once it's gone all of a sudden the natural effect or much more natural effect gets there. This is an experiment. It doesn't look that natural because of what's there. But look, it gives you some ideas. We've got a rocky outcrop falling down into the water's edge. Great for some of those amphibians. We've got logs again set up so they're draped over the edge. And my favourite thing is turf. It's quick, it's simple, and it completely hides any edge of any pond you want. And if your pond runs into your lawn, turf over the edge. Don't see that plastic liner. The lawn just ends there. If you drape it into the water, it never dries out. It capillary reaction keeps the, water, the roots of the turf wet or the grass wet, and it draws up and it doesn't dry out even on a hot day. We're lucky because thanks to Bob the tree surgeon, he was finds bits and bobs. We've got a great, really, really old oak post here, just giving that effect of a fallen gateway and the ditch pond that had formed behind it through lots of years of use. That's the overall effect we're looking for. And of course, we've even got some old gravestones here. We've got a log pile again for those amphibians. But what we need now is the area between to naturalize. Because from this amphibian breeding pool to this amphibian summer quarters stroke hibernaculum, is three or four meters of desert nothing wants to cross that you're exposed you're going to get eaten so hopefully the natural vegetation over this winter and next spring is going to naturalize across this area here and all the way through giving them a reasonable area to hibernate breed and live and forage in but we'll see Time and nature soon works its magic. Short-tailed field vole here at the Falkland Centre. 
I've got lots of these guys. <laughs> and we don't mind them at all, they're not a pest. They create a lot of burrows and tunnels, which are actually really important for bumblebees to nest in. And a great natural source of food for the local kestrels and tawny owls that frequent the Falcon Centre as well. So, short tailed field vole. How cute is that? Thanks, thanks for watching. Hope you've enjoyed the vlog. If you do get a chance to go and visit the Wildwood Centre down in Kent, I strongly recommend you do. I'd probably go personally late spring, make sure those reptiles are out on show as well. We'll keep you informed as things morph and change with Icarus Falcon and Raptor Exotics over the coming months for sure. And for now, don't forget, you know what, like and subscribe. See you next time.